it just got to me a little bit <clears throat> as I was listening to the music. It's There's so many people that I can, just off the top of my head, that should be here, should have been here for the study. That, you know, seeds like this could have uh, been very, very well planted. But hopefully they'll hear from somebody else because maybe they don't want to hear it from us. It's okay, too. Maybe they'll make it. You know. I understand the theology behind the thief on the cross. I understand why the Lord allowed that to happen that way and why he said what he said that day. So, but anyway, for um, to finish off this series, which I'm so surprised I'm doing it this Sabbath, um, the Lord also blessed me with uh, something to do uh, after this sermon. Otherwise, this sermon would be two hours long. Uh, because there was something I wanted to share after the after the sermon from prophecy, and the Lord revealed that, uh, and I couldn't hold my excitement. And I told everybody, everybody that joined us for Friday night study that we we're going to start doing this every Sabbath. But uh, but after the sermon, you know how we do the fellowship hour afterwards, and I usually sit there and gab till four o'clock, and then Brother Andre comes in and uh, shares with us current events, and then Sean or Eli get on uh, the the mic and share what the Lord has laid upon their hearts at 5 o'clock. But I think uh, until, for as long as we can, go, like after the sermon, you know, have a little bit of fellowship, like normal, obviously, but jump right into Spirit of Prophecy in regards to areas where she talks about what's happening and will happen, you know, before, during, and after the latter rain the loud cry, wherever, you know, our day, when we have to get ready and while we're doing the work and all this other stuff. So, um, and if any of you, and if any of you would like us, uh, like for me to read from a specific area of uh, Spirit of Prophecy and then let the Holy Spirit move in so that we can have uh, hopefully additional light on it, like we do on Friday nights. I just read Spirit of Prophecy and let the Holy Spirit take it from there. If you have something from Spirit of Prophecy that you would like us to all read together, email it to me, and I'll add it to the stack. But uh, I'm, I'm probably going to be jumping. After this, i got some stuff that more or less pertains to this sermon, this final sermon, Part 4 of the Latter Rain, uh, prepping for the Latter Rain, Part 4. Uh, but the um, uh, I wanted to jump into that book that we're handing out for free to everybody that wants it. And then, of course, we're mailing hundreds of them every month. Uh, and thank you for the blessings that you're sending financially because we never ask for a dime, <laughs> you know. I mean, it is your duty to tithe and give love offerings, but people have just, you know, been helping us out, and so it's not even an issue to get these books out now. It's just amazing. And so, but anyway, in regards to uh, you know, the way we're going to be doing this, I hope and pray that... Uh, I know the Lord's pleased with it because he's the one that came up with the idea while I was in the, I think it was in a midday prayer. Oh, no, 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 that's right. I was actually, work, well, I was, I'm always in prayer when I'm working on sermons and stuff. And towards the end of the sermon, I'm thinking, oh, wow, this is going to make this sermon huge if I go here. And then the thought just, bam, came right in my mind to, to do what I just shared we're going to be doing. So, But anyway, for this final part we have to look at something now in regards to the one of the many ways that the enemy of souls is going to cause many people to be left out of that number that we're all going to be we all right now are striving to be in of course you know the uh, Gideon band or the 144,000 for those of you that are new we call the 144,000 the Gideon band or I do you, know, you don't have to I just do because I like down with Gideon because it's going to go down with us more or less the same way we're going to stand firm and no harm comes to us but uh one of the ways the devil is going to be preventing people from getting into that number is by using vanity and pride, as well as a lessening of the truth so as to gain notoriety among those that do not study the word as they should. There are far more fake Christians than there are obedient word ones in the world today. And that's just, yeah, that's it's the last days. We know this was going to be normal. But uh, m- millions of pastors... Count on this crop of lost souls so as to make merchandise of the people by demanding tithe and offerings from them at every sermon or TV broadcast or whatever, or they have their 
donation telethons and stuff. Oh, it's just ridiculous. They're in it for the money, and it's just... I mean, the fact they got the 501c3 proves that hands down, but check out what Second Peter... Oh, here, let me put the notes. I just noticed the notes in the room. They should be already on the server. Oh, wow, that's January 23rd. All right, hold on. Let me just change the date, because I already uploaded it to the server. So all I got to do here is go inside this thing and uh, change the date to today. Let's see, it's... Two thirteen twenty one. Yep, there it is. Final. Okay. There you go. All right. So Second Peter. Uh, actually, it should be one to three. It says one to four up there. I'm sorry. It's, I ended three. So ignore that. It's just you know Second Peter chapter two verses one to three says this. And this is, of course, talking about our day. It says, "For but there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you, who privately shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that them, and bring upon themselves swift destruction. And I've seen preachers laugh at judgment against them on camera. We saw it actually happen in July if you know what I'm talking about and so verse 2 and many shall follow their pernicious ways by reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of yeah, because that's what they're doing they're saying, it's the age of lying so it's bound to happen you know what we preach is lies and what they preach is truth they're saying and so verse 3 here check this out because this everybody can see this one even if you're not a bible studier Verse 3 says, And through covetousness shall they with feigned words make merchandise of you, whose judgment now of a long time lingereth not, and their damnation slumbereth not. The fallen pastors all over this world are more interested in the money, the souls they are ordained to shepherd. That's why the prophecy concerning them making an image to the beast in Rome was so easily seen by students of prophecy when these pastors signed on to the 501c3 contract with the second beast of Revelation, knowing that in so doing they would become rich, worshipping the money in the pockets of their church members instead of worshipping the Lord who will give them wisdom to help guide them, cause them, to lose all utterance and they simply cannot teach truth because the Lord has removed the truth from them after they proved themselves unworthy of it. They were tested, they failed and then the rest is history. And because they have not the truth they must rely, uh, rely on the lies of the arch enemy of our God. And because of their worldly lusts the Lord does not send them faithful Christians to be part of their number and we've seen this many times when people attack us even, including people that were part of our number. They leave, and a bunch of people that hated us previously, for somehow they find each other and they all have a group hug. Birds of a feather, I guess, huh? But then that doesn't really matter in such churches because the pastor just wants to get rich and the lukewarm Christians just want to be called Christians to take away their shame anyway. So it it's really doesn't matter to them. But brothers and sisters, the only way to escape the temptation of self-glory or a desire to water down the truth so as to keep the people in the pews, you know, or, or, or even the desire to skate into heaven by the skin of your faith. We, we, we need to understand that even if we saw what Paul, Paul saw you know, spiritually and, and physically in his day, we still need to trim our lamps in our day so as to be in that number. We're going to see things, hopefully, that Paul saw. I mean, eventually, yeah, we'll be actually stepping into the third heaven, but still, we're going to see things he didn't see. But we have to be obedient now. Otherwise, we're not going to get that, that blessing. He had the former reign, the early reign, as we all have now. That's the Holy Spirit in the heart. But we're going to get the latter reign that falls more abundantly. But think about this. When we are on the run, the last year of our life on earth during the plagues, because we're only going to have to run for as long as those plagues are falling, Right? I mean, sure, some of us might have to skedaddle out of our houses or out of our neighborhoods or wherever. I hope you're not in the cities at this time. But you might have to you know, jostle your living quarters because they're going to be killing Christians all over the place because the Pope's going to be out there saying, look, if they don't keep Sunday holy, the planet is going to be 
is going to die, and we're all going to die on it. And so we're going to be hated off the chart. Hence the reason for the death decree, to make it legal to kill. And that way, you know, that's when they're, they, they get their final power because Satan knows now, oh, look, I've got them all hating, so now I'm going to go for the gusto, and he's going to go and get that, you know, the death decree. But that's a whole other sermon. So when we're on the, le- on the run the last year of the plagues, and you have to know during that time, we will no doubt be un- unable to bring our Bibles. <laughs> But we can still do Bible study due to the promise of John fourteen twenty six and 27, right? Check it out. It says, The Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name. Now, see, now, now do you see why they're trying to say the Holy Spirit doesn't exist? You get the Holy Spirit off the table, he can't do what he promised to do in John 14. That's why they're saying he don't exist. But look about, he, he's, he's even being called here in the third person. The Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name. In agreement with me, or in agreement with the Father, because they're all one in agreement. That's what the one means. Our God is one. Our God is one in agreement with his Son and the Holy Spirit. I mean, here's a clincher. Ask them who Melchizedek is. That's all you got to do for these people that say the Holy, Holy Spirit doesn't exist. Have them explain, using Scripture, who Melchizedek is. Watch how twisted the verses appear or how you'll get crickets, one or the other. It's a sad state of affairs out there, but it was prophesied. And so again, the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. And then verse 27 says, Peace I leave you. I, I, no, a peace I leave with you. My peace I give unto you. Oh, I praise your name, Jesus, for this peace. Because it's sad to watch people you love that don't want to believe the way you do and don't want to be ready and don't want to go to heaven. They seriously are choosing. They prefer the world. They don't want to give it up, so they don't want to believe it's ending. And as hard as, like I was saying in the prayer, it's constant tear dangling. But still, at the same time, the peace is off the charts. Father, you know, whatever thy will is, you know. We're okay with it. We understand the wheat and tares. So again, peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. Not as the world giveth, because it's all fake and temporary anyway, right? Uh, so not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. And when you study his word, the fear is gone. You know there will be no fear during the plagues. The fear is where the wicked are standing. They're so scared they're getting the mark. They're, they have no port in a storm. They have no anchor. They have to go with what the government says because that's who they've been trusting all along. But if you go with Christ, yeah, you may lose your life, but you'll gain eternal life. You know, unless we study our Bibles now, and I mean really dig in to see what the Lord would have us see, we're not going to be able to remember whatsoever he has said unto us because our lack of Bible study now means he never said it to us. Seriously, when it gets fearsome in those final days, our hearts will be troubled and very afraid because without his word within our hearts, we're going to have no peace. And Satan will focus on our lack of Bible and really cultivate that fear so as to make things so crazy and so scary that we're going to do anything to escape that fear. I mean, I praise his name for his word because even though I cannot memorize as I would like to, I have often seen the promise of John fourteen twenty six bring Bible verses unto me at the very moment I need them. I know for a fact when that day comes, he, he's going to remind me of his word each and every time I need him to when I'm out there on the run with no Bible in hand. You know, and I, I, I just can't imagine a day without my Bible in hand. I start every day for nearly 40 years. I've got to have my Bible every morning. It's just life. It's the words of life. You know, I had a dream not too long ago. And I'm going to share this because it uh, it hit me pretty hard. But in, the, in this dream, uh, I was trying to protect the church family while we were under attack. And I was doing all I can to preach to those that sought to attack us. Me, because I thought, you know, I'm not looking at the person attacking me. I'm looking at uh, a soul that needs Christ. I don't care though about the hatred that they're showing me. I don't care that they want to kill me and attack me or whatever, or persecute, whatever the case may be, because I know it's just a demon honor in them. So I know who I'm fighting. 
And so I could care less what Satan wants to put in front of my eyes. I'm looking deeper. And so I'm concerned for the people that were attacking me in the dream. And as I was sharing with them the end time warnings to try and help them see the truth, I needed to share a certain Bible verse where I could not recall what was said at all in the passage. I knew the location of the verse for some strange reason because I know I, I've shared it many times before. But the words would not come at all. Not even a, like even if I had a tablet nearby where I was able to go into e sword and just start putting in a couple of words and find that verse. No, nah, no, nah, I have a couple of words. And so I prayed right there in a dream. And I asked the Lord to give me those words as he promised he would do in John fourteen twenty six, And instantly, right there in a dream, I was able to recite that Bible verse word for word. That's what you and I are going to be seeing in the coming days. I can't, I can't memorize anymore. My ill-spent youth messed all that up. Plus, I'm older now, and it's not like I, you know, when you get older, things start to break down, I guess. <laughs> so his promises are very real. If we neglect our daily study in prayer, it's our duty of study in prayer because we're soldiers. We're in a holy war. No, we're not going out there and killing people and shooting guns and bullets and stuff. No, we don't have to do it. We don't even have to defend ourselves the way the Wesleyans did. No, we don't have to. That was a different world. Now we're going to run forward like David or even Gideon and have, you know, with Gideon, of course, he, he defended himself, but the Lord fought that fight. That's my reason for using Gideon, in, you know, my little word for the 144,000. I don't want to call us. <laughs> Some people might say, oh, well, you could say, you, you, you could uh, emulate David and what he did with Goliath. But yeah, but then some people are going to say, well, then you've got to call yourselves Davidians. That's, that's not happening, you know, because we all saw what went down with that. Because we're nowhere near that kind of thing. We're, we're sticking with Scripture. And so if we neglect our daily duty of study and prayer <clears throat> and refuse to stay at our post, even now, what the Lord needs us to do so as to be ready for the final work. He's not going to be able to send a single drop of rain from heaven when the latter rain falls upon us. He's not going to give us one. See, this is where the SDAs are having a major problem. They're waiting for the Sunday laws so that they can go forward and say something. It's proof they don't even have utterance. They don't have understanding. If they keep that mindset, they'll never ever... They're going to get the mark. No problem. I mean, their church leaders have already got dozens of Sunday keeping churches and the, and the general conference just said last year yeah no big or no a couple of years ago no big deal when someone asked them about seventh day seventh day adventist churches keeping sunday holy in the church buildings and bringing sunday keeping people in yeah no big deal a lot of people laughed and uh, laughed out loud when i said the jews were going to keep sunday holy and break the sabbath yeah they've been doing that for years now they passed the law in tel aviv it's legal to uh, break the Seventh-day Sabbath. So if you think the SDAs are not going to do it, they're far weaker than the Jews were ever because they had, uh, the um, the SDAs were given the truth. And so, yeah, we're in a war, but this is a holy war without weapons. Uh, well, except, of course, the weapons the wicked will, of course, have, but then their weapons are useless against the sword of the Lord that we wield with wisdom, faith, and power. That, of course, being... You know, the two-edged sword, Old Testament, New Testament. And by the way, for those young in the faith that may have a, you know, like a little twinge of fear pop up when I said the wicked will have weapons, remember this promise from our Lord, our Savior, and our King Jesus. It's found in Isaiah fifty-four seventeen, right there on your screen. No weapon that is formed against thee shall prosper. And every tongue that will rise against thee in judgment thou shalt condemn. This is the heritage of the service of the Lord, and the righteousness is of me, saith the Lord. And just so you know, it's not about what we know. It's not about how spiritually smart we are. And it's not about how many souls come to Christ via our testimony and evangelistic work. It's about Jesus Christ, his righteousness, and our obedient surrender to all that his will dictates unto us. For as it is clearly stated in Isaiah 64, Verses 6 to 8. Let me scroll up there for you a little bit in the room. I don't have a lot of verses for this uh, final version of the uh, uh, um, or, or series, well, sermon of the series. But 64, uh, Isaiah 64, verses 6 to 8 says, But we are all as an unclean thing, and all our righteousness are as filthy rags. 
and we all do fade as a leaf. And our iniquities, like the wind, has taken us away. And there is none that calleth upon thy name, that stirreth himself, or stirreth up himself to take hold of thee. For thou hast hid thy face from us, and hast consumed us because of our iniquities. But now, O Lord, thou art our Father. We are the clay, and thou art our potter. And we are all the work of thine hand. So again, even if you too were caught up to the third heaven to see what Paul saw in New Jerusalem, you're still undone. And your righteousness is as worthless as filthy rags in comparison to that works us as the potter works the clay. The bottom line is this, that we must let Christ mold us and not be as those that say they are you know, self-made men. I mean, that, that's the ultimate insult unto God as far as I'm concerned, uh, because he literally named each and every one of us while we were still in the womb. And so how could someone even say, self-made man, yeah, let's get out there with a hammer and nails and build a human, jump into it and say, that's me. That's ridiculous. I mean, just as Jeremiah was lifted up out of the muck in the mire via the filthy rags that uh, uh, Abed, uh, Ebed, what was, uh, Ebed Melech, yeah, that's the guy. I, I think he was uh, like a eunuch. Uh, he, he bound all these rags together and uh, that to get him out of that, like when he was thrown into that, we would call that a, like a cistern today, like an empty well, but it had like a slime and stuff, like maybe an inch or two of slime on the bottom, and it was all cold and wet. Uh, or, or what about Joshua, who had his filthy garments removed from him, even though Satan, who made his rags filthy in the first place, stood nearby demanding otherwise. We too are going to be blessed by the Lord, but only when we let go and let God have his way. No matter what the trial he has called us to live through, we got to let him run it for us because there's a reason we're going through that trial. We need to go through that trial to be able to handle what's coming in the next couple of years because I'm hoping within two to three years that latter rain falls so that we're ready for what they're going to do four years later in 2027 because they're going to do what they're going to do to try to shut us up. And so with all that in mind, if those of you that study and understand prophecy are going to notice, all ten virgins had oil in their lamps, did they not? I mean, that's all. That, they all had the Holy Spirit at one time, which is contract, uh, rather contrary uh, to, to, to Baptist theology that declares one saved, always saved. The problem is the five virgins that were foolish waited until a major event finally happened before seeking more oil. That is what's going on right now. I mean, it's no different than most Christians today who wait for the Jesuit contrived secret rapture to happen or the Seventh-day Adventists who are now being taught to believe they do not have to go forth and warn the people about Sunday laws until they're finally passed and enforced. These foolish virgins waited until they had the proof they wanted before their eyes and the prophecies were finally fulfilled before uh, before they were even going to believe or even act on them. And again, this is no different than Ananias and Sapphira, like I mentioned earlier, who dropped dead in the doorway because lazy Christians like this, who stand in confusion, can only feel the need to pray for the latter rain. Right? Lazy Christians like this, who stand in confusion, can only feel the need to pray. And they won't get off their couches when it gets scary. But, but when you live your life like this, you, you become complacent with the status quo. And, and thereby, uh, you become unable to see the signs at all. You can't see them. Because uh, an untrimmed lamp means they weren't studying their Bibles and without the Bible study, the light of truth can't shine well enough for them to see what's lurking in the shadows. And a lot of people look at that parable of the foolish virgins, the ten virgins, and say, well, they're snoring. There's not much you can... Look, it's a parable. It's not a bunch of people in the church just laying in some bed waiting until something happens and then just yawn, get out of bed and get to work. No. These are you know, living, walking Christians that aren't 
studying their Bibles. They're walking as if they're in a daze, as if they're asleep in truth. They're still doing their day-by-day duties. They're still living their lives and still claiming themselves to be Christians. But they're not walking the way they should. You know, without the light of truth, the entire pathway goes dark. And when it goes dark, you stumble and fall. Solomon put it plainly when he said in Proverbs 4.19 that the way of the wicked is as darkness. They know not at what they stumble. They don't even know what they're tripping over. The reason they do not know why they stumble is because without the light of truth from the Bible, you cannot see what the prince of darkness put in your path to make you trip and fall in the first place. It's just that simple. That is why the Lord used a lamp when illustrating the plight of the five foolish virgins and the blessings of the five wise virgins. They were all virgins. They were all Christians. They were all believers. Case in point, look at the SDA church again as a perfect example of the foolish virgin. They, more than any church on this planet in modern times, or even in the, since the apostles themselves for that matter, they had the prophetic truths given to them on a silver platter. I mean, off the chart blessings. They, they even had a woman, you know, as, as the prophet Joel predicted, they even had a, a prophet in their, in their midst, Ellen White. They even had, where she gave even better understanding at this, you know, the Old and the New Testament uh, doctrines as well as prophecies. They knew all about the prophecies of everything from Antichrist to the investigative judgment when they started out. Are you kidding me? But as the years rolled on, even after the great disappointment, which, by the way, was prophesied, and, the, and when that happened and the Lord didn't come as quickly as some hoped, they became complacent with the existing state of affairs and stopped doing the work of trimming their lamps and just kept busy with whatever they were doing. You know, many, no doubt, thought to wait until the next major event happens before getting us about the fine-tuning of their faith and their understanding. Some dear SDA people have even told me personally that they will get busy doing the work, but only when Sunday laws are passed, and that statement alone proves they never will. I mean, if they study their Bibles now, they would never have made such a, a strange statement with true Bible study. They would have, they would have known Sunday laws come after the loud cry goes forth, not before it. This is why there are many false teachers are preaching it that way. They don't want them to be ready. Rome has taken their church, and they sit in complacency. Their disobedience has made them unable to understand prophetic truth, so as, and so a great delusion is already upon them. And as I have said before, and will say again, all those people staying in the SDA church means they are actually the very ones that are going to be shaken out of the true church. I may even have an, uh, a video on that. Because I, I remember the graphic, using the graphic in a video. All right, hold on, somebody. Oh, man. Anyway. Oh, hold on a second. I'm going to answer this text because he needs to be in church. So hold on. In church, I'll just put. Um, okay, I'll leave it at that. All right. So, their disobedience. Is you know I mean, I mean think about it the fact they have the 501c3 you know 501c3 that confirms all this hands down. I mean had they been obedient unto the Lord they never would have gotten that 501c3 in the first place they would have had clarity of prophetic thought and known on day one that signing such a contract is fulfilling the actions of those the devil will use to create an image of the beast right here in America. The SDA uh, people are still in, in the prophetic timeline only now. They're on the bad end of it. I mean, seriously, they knew. Even back then, in 1954, they even knew back then, when it was first being put forth in a bill by Lyndon Johnson, that the America was the second beast of revelation. They knew these things. They had utterance. You know, what most in apostasy uh, fail to realize is a form of the Sunday laws have already been passed. If you think about it, Way back on May 19, 1961, 
when Roman Catholic President John F. Kennedy signed it. Okay, granted it's not the one that's prophesied to happen, but it was a religious law written by a Roman Catholic president so as to have the foundation for our day. The remnant of her seed picked up the task to try and warn the people of God because the Seventh-day Adventist people stopped doing the work. You can see that in Matthew 20, verses 1 to 7, in fact. Or even Revelation 12, 17. The remnant of her seed are doing the work, not the woman anymore. The devil's just angry at the woman because of what she did in the ninth hour. He's making war with us because we're doing the work. And so when that cry gets loud in the very near future, hopefully within the next year or two, or three at the most, I hope, the people are going to leave the apostate churches when we go forth because we're going to have that ability. The Lord's going to, if, we're, if we stay obedient, it is then the government agents that they call pastors will use their political powers granted them on December 2nd, 2017, wherein they can now lobby for religious laws and they will demand laws be enforced to try and stop the truth we share that's causing their church members to leave. The preachers of filthy lucre don't like losing their precious money. And did you notice? Bush did say what he said on, what was it, March 7th, 20, 2006? I don't think I have this in my notes, but I'm going to share it right now. He said when he put forth the 501c3 as an executive order, uh, because prior it was just the bill that Johnson set up, hadn't been passed yet, but he put up an executive order saying, you know, the need for, you know, enforcement, which it never did. Obama let it sit, and all the other presidents let it sit until Trump came along on a December 2nd, 2017, in the middle of the night. I think it was around two, two between 2 and 4 a.m. on Sabbath day, and he, he made it into law. So Bush said everyone under the 501c3 is considered a government agency. Kennedy stated all government agencies have to keep Sunday holy. <laughs> Nobody's talking about that, are they? No, no, no. They're keeping that part shut. It's by law. The Seventh-day Adventist Church keeps Sunday holy. They've got a 501c3. They are now a government agency. They can't open their doors on Sunday. But they're not enforcing that yet. No, no, no. Not until it gets hot and heavy. They're going to do it just like they've always done it. So, of course, the preachers won't declare when, when the day finally happens that they want Sunday laws to stop the remnant from preaching because if they do... You know, they're going to look like a bunch of hypocrites in their ecumenical cesspool wherein they're, they are all supposedly in the same ecumenical church where they claim everyone is a Christian. So they can't say um, they want Sunday laws to stop us, to stop the preachers. Instead, they will claim Sunday laws must be enforced so that the people can show repentance towards God so as to stop the calamities Rome claims is the end result of breaking the Roman Sabbath. But as the obedient remnant people know, the prophetic facts are that those calamities are the end result of them breaking the true Sabbath in the first place. And so that has to be part of our message. When we go out there and we tell them that Sunday laws is the mark, you also have to tell them how they're going to enforce it. Because when you say these things, granted, yeah, the, the overwhelming majority of people aren't going to believe what you're saying, but you, they can't unhear it. You planted a seed. You've got to let them know. You've got to let them know that when... When, when they pass the Sunday laws, they're going to use climate change to do it and say that all the calamities are happening because people are keeping uh, or breaking Sunday. They've got to keep Sunday holy to stop the calamities. That has to be put into their hearts. That has to be put into their soul. That has to be put into their ears so that when they actually do do that, the Lord will give increase onto that seed that you planted a month earlier or a year earlier. Who knows? You can't just go out there and say Sunday laws is the mark. You have to give them everything they need to hear. So that when it happens, they'll go, whoa. That one preacher that I thought was crazy predicted this. And no, we didn't predict it. We just told them what the Bible said was going to happen. I mean, they may look at you as a prophet or whatever. Who cares? You're not in it for yourself. Remember what I said earlier? This is about Jesus Christ and his righteousness. He's the one that wrote the Bible, not you. So don't be getting on that big old pedestal because if you do, it's going to get so high up you can't even, you'll never even be able to see the path you used to walk on. But boy, you'll be all prideful and happy and all puffed up until the plague's hit. And then you could be jumping around looking just like Amos did and you're not going to find those verses of vindication. So anyway, the fact students of prophecy have been exposing that lie for well over 100 years 
uh, you know, about the Roman Sabbath and uh, all the calamities. Uh, this is why they need to hide the real reason behind their demand for Sunday laws when it all goes down. The powers that be do not want to vindicate us publicly. You know, that's counter-effective. It's, it's not very effective for them to make us look good. But they're going to have to anyway. They're not going to have a choice if you put a message out the way it should be put out so that when they do this, they do vindicate us. Uh, they will, however, have no problem vilifying us. <laughs> That's going to be their mainstay because the majority of the people didn't. And think about this. Every single solitary person on the planet will have heard what we preach because that was prophesied. They all have to make that decision personally. But the nice thing about all this is those that do finally open up their Bibles will join our ranks due to our Father giving increase unto the seeds we planted pr previously. Whether they call the city us or slap them upside the head, don't matter. Get them the truth, and, and later on, hopefully, they'll, they'll, they'll hear it and understand it. I mean, the truth is, even if they're babes at the time when doing so, they're going to be shocked when the powers that be do exactly as the prophecy said they're going to do. I mean, the old adage would then make perfect sense for some people in that if Christian prophecy is so bogus, as so many people are saying, why are they doing exactly as the prophecy said they're going to do anyway? <laughs> I mean, how did they get around that? In fact, many are already starting to see this as a prophesied fact when they remember what we said about the Pope using climate change to enforce Sunday laws, and now they read the articles about, you know, green Sabbaths. Yeah, the green Sabbath. Boy, that, that's, that's prophecy fulfilled right there just by talking about the Green Sabbath. Why is it called the Green Sabbath? Oh, it's for the environment to stop all these climate change issues. That's what we've been saying they were going to do. And so we're already being vindicated now. And so this, it's just nuts. But, and for those of you who want to find the Green Sabbath, it's on my Sabbath attack page. There's all sorts of articles on there, thousands of them. And so, Sunday laws have already been suggested, and the Roman Sabbath has already been declared a green Sabbath. And so we all know. Now, 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 because of all that, the church has already shines of an exodus towards the present truth, thanks to the Holy Spirit blessing our efforts of years past to the you know to today. But many SDAs are still sitting back, just waiting for the big event, and just like the foolish virgins, they are destined to be, and as Jesus uh, to be, and you know, just as Jesus. Uh, said in Matthew they're going to be, right? That's uh, Matthew 11, verses 22 to 24. It's the, it's the last verse I'm sharing. It says, uh, I say unto you, it shall be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon at that day of judgment than for you. And thou, Capernaum, which are exalted unto heaven, shall be brought down to hell. For if the mighty works which have been done in thee had been done in Sodom, it would have remained until this day. But I say unto you that it shall be more tolerable for the land of Sodom in the day of judgment than for thee. You know, and, and, and I don't need to remind most of the Seventh Day Remnant Church about uh, you know doing the work because as many have already stated, we are known to be a working church. And yes, that is what angers most people, and especially those from the Ninth Hour Church, because we're being blessed to finish the work they started. Just as prophecy said, the remnant would do. It's right there in Matthew 20, verses 1 to 7. And yes, that remnant will be where our Father selects his Gideon band. I honestly believe. I have two videos on that. <laughs> I think it may be three. No, I think it's just two. Two. But we have some studies and stuff like that on the uh, 144,000 page. If you just go to remnantguy.org forward slash 144,000.htm, that's the... Uh, uh, 140, you know, the Gideon band page, but I, I just put 144 on the top of it. Uh, but there are some in our number, sadly, that still have to get busy. And like the SDA people, they need to be reminded of the man that buried his talent. Better yet, remember the certain king which invited all the people to his son's wedding in Matthew 22? Or how about the certain man that made the great supper in Luke 14? Everyone they invited made excuses as to why they couldn't come. Is this not the same thing that's happening right now in all the apostate churches? I mean, do we not already see our Lord's wedding feast preparing as we speak? All the signs are upon us that our king is soon to return for his faithful bride. But the people trapped 
and the confusion of apostasy inside all the Vatican polluted churches are giving all sorts of excuses as to why they can't do the work right now. I mean, the SDA is just saying, yeah, wait, wait, wait. When Sunday laws are forced, yeah, we'll go out. They're blind because they all put their faith in their pastors. They worship the creature more than the creator, right? It's just like prophecy said they would. And these pastors are fabricating all sorts of excuses for them because you could tell that's what's going on because how come they're all having the exact same excuse unless the pastor said it first? It's like when they used to tell me, oh, don't say that the Seventh-day Adventist Church is Babylon. Ellen White said never do that. And after about the, you know, 10th or 15th person, they finally gave up when I pulled back in context and showed them, your pastor's lying to you. She never said what he said she sang. She was talking about the church, the people in her day. But look at these statements she said in our day, that the SDA church will become Babylon. So the pastors stopped sending the people to try to, you know, get us to join their crowd. Because I haven't got an email like that and I don't know how long. And it's because Satan knew it's just a waste of time. I'm actually helping people see truth. And when they when they when they uh, twist the scripture, I'm going to put it back in context. It's just part of being a teacher all the time. And so anyway, the the wise virgins on the other hand n knew they needed the oil long before the final events came because with that oil is kept. You know, it's a well trimmed lamp. You know, it's it's um, daily Bible study and daily prayer. Uh, we can see more clearly now. Uh, as to what time it is, thanks to our fathers opening up his word to us each and every day when we do this, too, uh, of course. I mean, I can't wait. And this has been going on for, you know, almost 40 days. I, I just, I can't, you know, like in the morning, I can't wait to crack open that Bible. Well, I use a tablet, but same thing. Because I'm, I'm, I'm always typing notes. And so it helps us to live day by day. The lack of study and prayer, on the other hand, is the reason that the foolish virgin's lamps ran dry. Seeking more wisdom from, an on, from on high via the Holy Spirit's influence in their studies and prayer time wasn't as important to the foolish virgins and as, is, as it is to us, those of us that want to make our Father smile. I mean, all throughout the Bible and history, we see that the people of God often falter and then wait for major prophetic events to hit right before going forth to warn others. Or they are waiting for some special blessing from heaven upon them before finally doing some work. Or, and for those that can't do the work but have the means by which to help us get it done, yeah, they won't send a penny or a dime. Or they'll just partially tithe and give a smattering of a love offering. And again, don't think me um, off kilter for saying such things because you know I never ask for donations. It's your duty to tithe. So, But the wise people of God, they are busy now, even before the Sunday laws are enforced with the buy and sell amendments. According to the scripture and the spirit of prophecy, those laws are only enforced due to the message of the loud cry that is going to be given to all his obedient bride, thanks to the outpouring of the latter rain in abundance. The foolish virgins never see this until it's way too late. There's people out there actually saying the latter rain is falling now. Yeah, some little spattering here, spattering there. Some people can see it that way. I even used to think it that way, but that's actually just a little bit better portion of the Holy Spirit, the early rain. The latter rain's different. And if I've said differently in the past, I apologize because I make mistakes just like anybody else. And I have corrected my mistakes to the best of my ability. And if so, I'm doing it now. If, if I have done so in the past, I do it now. Because I may have said in the past the rain is sprinkling, if you will. But no, this is going to be a downpour, a cloud burst, if you will. Have you ever seen a cloud burst, by the way? Oh, man. I've been in them. You know, but to see one from a distance and see how when it hits the ground, it causes a big flurry of uh, activity on the edges, like you know, because it just hits. It's just me. And there's one on YouTube right now, but it's actually um, uh, fake. It's a uh, very good job, though. The guy did a really good job with it. It actually has a tornado in it and everything. It's really, really neat looking. But it's similar. Just take the tornado out of it. But I saw one years ago uh, where somebody was. Um, I think they were in an airplane and they were just getting ready to go above the clouds and all of a sudden one of them burst and they, they actually got it all on camera or something. It was really, really neat. And then you saw the dust and all that stuff when the rain hit the ground and just all spread out on the edges. It was just... And it hit like a, a mile square or something like that. It was a huge amount of rain. And so anyway, when it starts raining, all these people that, you know, the foolish virgins, they're going to be totally blind to it. They're going to be high and dry. The fact they cannot discern the voice of the Holy Spirit from the early rain upon them 
right now that's trying to get them to leave the apostate churches and get busy doing the work? <coughs> that proves hands down. There's, there's a strong possibility that they're going to end up getting the mark. And also keep in mind, and I'll close with this, the ten virgins do not represent the lukewarm people of the world who are claiming to be Christians at this time. You know the Isaiah chapter 4 verse 1 types? They're not Christians at all. But all ten of those virgins represent real Christians because they all had the Holy Spirit, or oil, as the prophetic parable declares. And so, as Spirit of Prophecy and Scripture confirm, many Christians with a smattering of the Holy Spirit because they're not really filling their lamps, are going to lose their salvation because of a lack of study and prayer. That is why many Sabbath keepers in and outside the Seventh-day Adventist Church now have all the prophecies mixed up, and some of them actually think the latter rain's falling on them, and so they got this new light, but it all contradicts the old light. They're talking about uh, the second coming happening at the end of the thousand years. They're they're talking about Christ standing on the earth and being peace with earth, uh, on earth for a thousand years too. Uh, they, of course, they're still doing the secret rapture thing. Uh, they're saying the one hour with the beast happens before the plague start, which means there's no... Think about this. If it happens before the plague start, then all during the plagues, there is no global power. <laughs> think about that. They can't have it if the one hour ends before the plagues begin. There's not going to be... A, the one hour represents a global power with the beast. If it happens before the plagues start then there is no global power during all seven plagues. And then who's going to be surrounding us at the end of plague six? Who's going to be able to gather all the people together other than, well, Satan, obviously, but who's he going to use to go together? It can't happen. So if you would like, um, because the Lord revealed this to me as I was working on my notes, I have some spirit of prophecy that I'm going to, sh that I'm going to share. But I'm not going to share it now. I'm going to end this sermon now. And then for the fellowship hour, we're going to go into, I think I got one, I got one from Review and Herald, I got one from Early Writings, and I don't know where this last one came from, I think it's probably still Early Writings. I have to dig into it. <laughs> so anyway, yeah, yeah, I'll share that later. So I hope and pray that you were blessed by what was shared this Sabbath day. I'll be back in a minute.